Hello, I think I might be live now. So this is going to be a very surreal experience. Um, firstly, welcome to my study where here we have baby Yoda that I crocheted. That's what lockdown's brought me to. Um, but this is very strange because obviously I can see me and I can see what I'm saying, but I can't see you. Um, so if you haven't already, thanks to Amy, Susanna and Yara, who've already commented their names. But if you haven't already just dropped your name in there, just so I know that you are logged into this live stream right now as it's streaming, um, that would be really helpful. What I'm going to do is I'm going to basically go through the questions that you guys sent to me ahead of time, which was brilliant. So thank you for sending me those. I had good fun getting to grips with Henry the Seventh. Um, I feel like he's the most underrated Tudor. I love him. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting to grips with Henry the Seventh with you today. Um, but also in those comments, if there are questions that come to you as we go along, things that you want me to try and explain further, um, things that you Feel I've missed, then I will do my best to answer those questions as we go. So obviously I'm a teacher. Here is my whiteboard that I have at home. Look at that beautiful thing here. Um, so first thing that we'll do is we'll go through the coursework spec. Uh, that is something that I and well myself and Miss Ulla haven't had a chance to explain to you yet, but it is really important. So I'll go through that with you first. Then secondly, Henry the Seventh, legitimacy and security. My favourite bit to do with Henry the Seventh. I love it. We'll talk about that. Then I've got finances. Those two sections are probably going to be the biggest bits. So Henry the Seventh, legitimacy and security and finances are going to be the chunkiest sections. Uh, then I'll briefly talk to you about foreign policy, religion. Comparison of Henry the Seventh and Henry the Eighth, which is something that popped up a few times, um, and also a final little section on Henry the Eighth. So we'll start with the coursework spec um, and how the coursework actually works, which is obviously really important for you. Um, so you should have been able to find a document that looks a little bit like this: coursework outline and guidance. This is on the coursework page on Google Classroom. So if you're not in that coursework page, I can send a link around to it with the information on how to join it after this is finished. But you need to go on there. When you go to the top, if you click classwork at the top of the coursework page, there are a million resources that are uploaded there from last year. So you can get onto that and you can find things like this, which is probably the most useful document I've ever written. So here it is, coursework outline and guidance. This basically takes you through all the things you need to know about what the coursework is for, what it's about, how much it's worth, how to write it, how to format it, all of that kind of stuff. So, um, and I can't work out if people who've just commented have only just joined, but if you've just joined, we're just gonna go through your coursework spec first. So um, I can tell that I wrote this and none of the other history department because it starts with congratulations you've reached the pinnacle of what it is to be a historian. You're going to study the Tudors. I love the Tudors. So firstly, the purpose of the coursework. Um, I'm going to basically just go through the subheadings that are on here. Uh, the purpose of the coursework. This coursework is an opportunity for you to get to grips with historiography. So you did a little bit of historiography with your GCSEs when you did the Weimar Nazi Germany paper um, and you had interpretation one, interpretation two, and you were kind of comparing similarities and differences in what views had to say. I'm just going to call you out. Nabil, stop talking to everyone else on here because I can read the comments and it's really distracting. But I'm glad that you're happy to see Hussein and that you were happy to see Livy earlier or live earlier in the chats. So that's great. But stop commenting now. So um, the coursework purpose all about historiography so in this coursework similar to with the Russia interpretation section is about you weighing up what historians have said so your coursework will be set up so that you will have three main historians who have had a debate or an argument about something so you would find maybe two that are strongly disagreed and one that was kind of in the middle, but it doesn't matter too much. The main thing is you have three historians who have debated a particular area of Tudor history. And then what you're going to do is weigh them against each other and discuss kind of what um, 
facts and things like that could be used to test the validity of their view. So is each historian telling the truth? Well, no historian gets it completely right, but you need to weigh up who you think is telling the, the most accurate story of what has happened in the past. Who has convinced you the most out of these three historians? And you are allowed to use other historians to kind of supplement it. Um, and that is encouraged to bring in other historians to support the discussion you have. But the main focus is on those three historians. They're the main ones. So, um, oh, look at this. These creme de la creme pieces will also give a clear judgment on the question at hand and place the historian writing the essay firmly into the historiographical debate being explored. So not only will you uh, be weighing up those historians, but you'll also give your view on the debate that you're discussing. And some of the ones we had last year were things like the success of Elizabeth I's foreign policy in Ireland. Um, they could be things like, I had one guy who wrote who was responsible for Henry VII's financial successes. That, that is another debate that exists. Um, you can have things about, did Thomas Cromwell produce a revolution in Tudor government? So there are all these kinds of debates. You could work with historian said, you're gonna decide who you think is most convincing, but also give your view. You don't have to wholeheartedly agree or disagree with any of those historians. Then the content. So this is the bit that I think a couple of you understandably were, were worrying about or concerned about as to what will actually be covered in the coursework. What do you need to talk about? Um, so the NXL A-level history course is not prescriptive in that they don't tell the history departments what the coursework must be on in terms of content. So um, I have made this coursework module and I have scoped it out and all of that kind of thing. And I'm going to make you study the Tudors because I think you should. Otherwise, you do too much modern stuff at History A-level for my liking. Um, so what happens with this coursework is the lessons you're doing at the moment are to give you an overview of all of the Tudors. So we go from Henry VII in 1485 all the way up to 1603 with Elizabeth I. You do not need to know everything there is possibly to know about every single Tudor because you won't talk about all of them in your coursework. So this introduction stage here is to give you the familiarity you need so that when it comes to choosing a debate topic, then you have a choice. You've got a wide range of choices and you can make it as niche as you like. I had one boy last year who did his whole coursework just on Henry VIII's will and who was going to take over the throne afterwards. So you can make it as niche as you like, um, but you will most likely only actually write about something that occurred in the reign of one of those Tudors, unless it's kind of like a crossover period, like Henry VIII passing the throne to Edward VI or something. But most likely you're going to be talking about a specific bit. So in lessons, you'll be taught about all five Tudor monarchs from Henry VII to Elizabeth in order to help you understand the reigns these five uh, things. Yeah, whatever. So you, you'll choose like a smaller little niche thing that is just for you. But to give you the best choice, we study all of it. Um, also, I know a couple of you have asked me questions about um, Edward IV or Richard III and people like that and whether or not you could talk about those in your coursework. Um, Nabil, seriously. Stop commenting to other people. It's really annoying. It's not necessary. Um, so with with that coursework, um, if you want to talk about Edward the Fourth or Richard the Third, I am more than happy for you to do that. I had a student last year who compared Henry the Seventh to Ed with the fourth in terms of like who was the most successful king and who brought about a revolution in the style of the monarchy. So Nabil. If I have to talk to you one more time, I will call your parents after this, for real. So stop it. Um, so once we have uh, done all of that, I've lost my train of thought now. You've annoyed me that much. Um, so you can talk about other things that are outside of the Tudors and compare it to the Tudors if you want to. But when it comes to doing those kinds of debates, you'll have to do it whilst obviously talking to me or Miss Ulla, depending on who's doing coursework with you next year, um, because Obviously, we don't want to make you choose a debate topic that's too big or too hard to do well on. OK, so in terms of the resources, there are lots of textbook resources we've used so far. The main resources you'll actually have to read and do for your coursework are going to be journal articles or chapters from books that historians have written. You'll be able to find a lot of those 
on the coursework page on Google Classrooms in the classwork section at the top. So you can find lots of resources there. And Ms. Lula and I will guide you to those when it's the right time to start doing that kind of histi historiographical reading so that you're kind of ready for it. Um, in terms of coursework schedule, that is on here at the bottom. So it goes all the way from summer term 2020. We actually started in the coursework slightly earlier because of COVID. So um, it will run up until, well, into next year. The Friday the 4th of December is your first draft of coursework is due at that point, And your final draft will be due on Friday the 26th of February. All of that is on this coursework outline and guidance sheet. So you can find it all. Um, sample coursework questions, a no, couple of examples there. There's how to format and lay out the coursework on there as well. It's a little bit picnicky. Uh, word count. Your coursework is going to be three to four thousand words long. You should not write more than four thousand words. You need to try and keep it under four thousand words in order to make sure that the argument you put together is really uh, strong, succinct and clear and to the point. Unlike me. Um, resource record is something that we will talk about when it comes to um, like doing the coursework. So, yeah, great question, Darren. You can find the coursework uh, document by um, if you go onto the coursework page on Google Classrooms. I'll send around a link to it on your classroom page as well. But if you go onto the coursework page, it is at the top under the classwork section. So I will try and send you a link to that somehow after this is finished. Um, so, yeah, the resource record, we'll talk about it when when we need to, when you start doing the readings. It's just a place for you to basically record what you have been reading from historians. It is required by the exam board. Um, so it's just a kind of like a reading log to keep as we go. Um, drafts for the coursework. You will only get one shot at doing a draft for the coursework. That will be due uh, for you guys in December. I think I forgot to change it from January on here, but it's due for you guys in December. Following the submission of this draft, each student will get a comments page from me or Miss Ulla with generic comments. We cannot give back to you the like the, the written things that we've done on your coursework. And um, the exam board are very particular about what we can say to you. So we'll give you like a list of generic comments. And then you will also get a one on one meeting with me or Miss Ulla, depending who your teacher is next year. And we will talk you through where those general comments apply to your coursework and we'll kind of discuss those kinds of things. Um, final hand in will be in February and you'll email me a copy of your coursework um, and then we will go from there. Um, Aaron, your question, will COVID have an effect on coursework in regards to possible extensions or more leniency? Um, no, sorry, because you've had more time on the coursework at the moment. We were due to start teaching you coursework after May half term. So we've actually given you a little bit more time already. Now, I am aware that obviously you doing all of it independently so far has been a lot more difficult um, and has been tougher for you. So what we'll do when we come back is Ms. Uller and I will plan lessons to recap some of the stuff you've done so far to make sure that you've got as solid an understanding as possible before you start deciding on debates and things. So we will make it as supportive as we can, but in terms of extensions and things like that, it's not gonna happen because where we've put those draft and final submissions as well is to try and look after you when it comes to things like your year 13 PPEs and stuff like that. We don't want it to coincide with that. So you'll have plenty of time, we'll take you through it. Don't worry about it, um, but no, we won't be necessarily allowing for there to be leniency and things like that because of COVID. OK, so unless things drastically change, but for now, no. Um, next thing we're going to look at is we're now going to go on to some of the content stuff. So we're going to go on to Henry VII and his legitimacy and security. Um, for this, I have done, like I've written quite a bit. So if I'm looking down, I'm really sorry, it's just so I make sure I don't miss anything that you guys ask me for. Um, so with his legitimacy and security, um, firstly, Henry VII's claim to the throne. A couple of you were asking about where his claim to the throne comes from. And I will show you, um, I've got a copy of the, of the uh, family tree that you guys have. So we've got this family tree here. I don't know if you can see that. Um, but 
Henry the Seventh is just here. Now he comes from the Beaufort line, which I think if you look at my other YouTube videos, of which there are like three on the walls of the roses. Sorry, I didn't do more. Um, but if you look at that, there is actually a whole video all about the Beaufort line and how Henry the Seventh gets his claim to the throne. Basically, by the time we get to 1485, Henry the Seventh is the only remaining kind of male candidate from the House of Lancaster. The main House of Lancaster line dies out with uh, Edward, who is the son of Henry the Sixth. Um, so if you were to go back into the family tree, and I'll try and hold it up, but it's a bit hard to do that and talk at the same time. But if you go right up to the top where you see there's John of Gaunt, just up here, he is the son of Edward III, he is the Duke of Lancaster, that is where the Lancastrians get their claim to the throne. Um, the House of Lancaster, being the royal house, begins with Henry IV when he takes the throne from his cousin Richard II. Henry IV becomes the first Lancastrian king, his son Henry V is then the next Lancastrian king, then it goes on to Henry VI. At this point, the Wars of the Roses start kicking off. So the Wars of the Roses begin during the reign of Henry VI and it's between the House of Lancaster and the House of York with Richard Duke of York being the main Yorkist claimant. Um, then Richard Duke of York is killed in 1460 and his son Edward Earl of March takes up the Yorkist cause. He then becomes Edward IV. This bit here you don't need to necessarily know, but it's just what's going on in the background. Um, Henry VI is eventually captured during the Wars of the Roses. He's brought to the Tower of London while Edward IV, the Yorkist king, is on the throne. And he is found murdered in the Tower of London. A lot of people are wondering about whether that murder was actually carried out by Edward IV and his brothers, George Duke of Clarence and Richard Duke of Gloucester. Um, but with him dies that Lancastrian heir. So... In order to get the next heir of Lancaster, you have to go right back to John of Gaunt and you need to go to his third wife, Catherine Swinford, who is there. Now, the reason the Beaufort line is not more prominent and is a weaker line is because it is a bastard line. So basically, the children that John of Gaunt and Catherine Swinford had were born before John of Gaunt and Catherine Swinford were married. Um, and they become known as the Beaufort children because they're not legitimate. Um, Henry IV, when he becomes king, he makes his half siblings uh, legitimate. He allows them to be legitimate heirs of John of Gaunt, but he rules that they're not allowed to inherit the throne. So he basically rules them out of inheriting the royal line. But that is where Henry Tudor gets his claim from. So the Beaufort line continues until you get to Margaret Beaufort, who is Henry VII's mother. Um, and she marries um, a guy called Edmund, yep, Edmund Tudor. And their son is Henry Tudor. So he's from the House of Lancaster. He's the last remaining like Lancastrian heir. But there are questions about how strong a claim it is because it's firstly from bastard line. Secondly, his claim to the throne is coming through his mother mostly as well. So that's one of the reasons there are sort of issues with his legitimacy. So hopefully people who are asking about um, where his claim to the throne came from, hopefully that explains some of it. But do feel free to go and like watch that other YouTube video and that will explain it a little bit better. Right, I will try and whiz through some of this a little bit uh, because I don't want to keep us for a really, really long time. So, uh, by 1485, Henry is the, the strongest Lancastrian claimant. Um, his right to the throne is still weaker than Richard III, because Richard III is a royal duke and is a legitimate person from the House of York. Um, therefore, it's important for Henry, when he invades England, to claim the throne by right of conquest, um, as William the Conqueror had done. It's worth pointing out that for kings and queens at this time and European princes, they would not invade another country and try to take over unless there was some kind of uh, precedent or some kind of reason that would allow them to do that. Henry Tudor has the reason with his like flimsy Beaufort claim, but he's claiming it by right of conquest so that people can't go, oh, well, you're a weak claimant, that kind of thing. And the other thing that he does to try and strengthen his claim once he has claimed the throne by right of conquest is he marries Elizabeth of York, who is the eldest daughter of Edward IV. And she's now kind of like the strongest York claimant 
I guess, that's left from the House of York at this point. Um, so he marries her, but he makes sure that he marries her after he's been crowned King of England so that nobody can say that he was trying to become king through his wife. So he goes by right of conquest, but then he gets crowned and then he marries Elizabeth of York to try and strengthen that hold that he has on the throne and also to try and quieten the Yorkist claimants and the other Yorkists who are out there because now that they've got their princess on the throne as the queen, hopefully some of them will die down and won't try and challenge her even if they want to challenge him. So other claimants to the throne, um, there are two big ones who are a big problem for Henry VII at the beginning. Um, so Henry quickly arranged lots of marriages for Elizabeth's sisters and other people from her mother's family to try and sort of get rid of that potential threat. But it still leaves two kind of main male like claimants from the House of York. So the first one is Edward Earl of Warwick and the second one is John de la Poole. Um, Edward Earl of Warwick is if you go back onto your family trees, he is the son of the brother of Edward IV. So Edward IV is here, um, his brother, George Duke of Clarence, and there is Edward Earl of Warwick. So Edward Earl of Warwick is the kind of most senior male claimant, I guess, in the House of York. The reason that his claim isn't stronger is that during the reign of Edward IV, his father, George Duke of Clarence, was executed for treason. He was actually drowned in a barrel of wine, which was I don't know if you think that's a baller way to go or not, but that's how it happened. Um, so he was executed for treason, which meant that his son wasn't meant to be able to inherit titles and things like that. However, he's still a son of the House of York. So Edward Earl of Warwick is still a threat for Henry VII. So when Henry VII becomes king, he acts decisively and he imprisons Edward Earl of Warwick when he's only 10 years old. As soon as he becomes king, Edward Earl of Warwick whisked off, he's in prison in the Tower of London. Um, Edward Earl of Warwick then grows up in prison and he's only released from prison when he is executed in 1499 um, after he was involved in helping Perkin Warbeck escape. Now, historians have questions actually about Edward Earl of Warwick. Did he have some kind of mental disability um, and some issues in that area that meant that he wasn't maybe um, as sharp as some of the other people at court and maybe Perkin Warbeck took advantage of that we don't know um, but it's just a really sad story 10 year old boy gets imprisoned because of who his family are and gets executed when he's still a very young man um, the other thing that's worth pointing out is that Stephen Gunn who is a very eminent historian of Henry VII, and he's the one who did a podcast about great men with George Osborne. Stephen Gunn in his podcast questioned how heavily the execution of Edward Earl of Warwick might have weighed on the mind of Henry VII, because I think it was quite clear to a lot of people that it was only his name and his bloodline that made him a threat, but actually the man himself or the young boy was really harmless and very innocent. Um, so we don't know whether Henry VII felt remorse for this. However, we do know that this was probably the safest move that Henry VII could have done for the stability of his reign. And the reason we know that is that the Lambert Simnel rebellion and things like that, Lambert Simnel claims to be Edward Earl of Warwick. And when he marches into the streets, the Yorkists come forward, people come forward cheering a Warwick, which is the call of the House of Warwick. And that basically shows that there's still too much popularity for potential rivals of Henry Tudor. The second one, John de la Poole, he is more dangerous, I would argue, in terms of his actual cunning and wiliness. He is the Earl of Lincoln. He was the nephew of Edward IV and Richard III. So he isn't one of the sons of the House of York. He's one of their nephews. Um, their mother, his mother was their sister. He's also a male claimant to the House of York, although his claim isn't as strong as Warwick's because it comes through his mother. So it's from a female line. The danger that Delapool had was that after the death of Edward, Richard, uh, the, sorry, after the death of his son Edward, Richard III names Delapool his heir. So when Richard III is king, um, he has a son called Edward who sadly dies in childhood. And so Richard needs to declare an heir and he makes John Delapool his heir, which means that although um, John Delapool isn't as senior as Edward Earl of Warwick in the House of York. He has been given more 
prominence, I guess, by Richard III already. Um, whether this whether this realistically could have been followed through is uncertain, but showed that Delapool had been given the idea that he could become the next king for the House of York. Initially, under Henry VII, Delapool claimed loyalty to the new king. However, he soon becomes quite impatient and he sought to overthrow Henry VII in the Simnel Rebellion. He joins it. Um, in this rebellion, it also becomes clear that it's actually Della Poole who was pulling the strings and was trying to unite the old Yorkist supporters behind Lambert Simnel as the Earl of Warwick. Um, but really, they, they knew they were uniting behind him. So kind of use like Lambert Simnel as like a figurehead. But really, he's the one running the operation and he's really calling people to support his claim to become the next king. He even uh, sought support from his aunt, Margaret Burgundy, who will pop up many times for his military campaigns. In 1487, during the Battle of Stoke, John Delapool was killed. The Delapool claim continues, however, because he has three younger brothers. It continues even into the reign of Henry VIII with John Delapool's younger brothers. However, the line was snuffed out as each brother was either executed or killed in battle during the reign of Henry VIII. With both of these, it becomes clear that Henry VIII, uh, Henry VII did not completely overcome the House of York and the Plantagenets, but he did successfully subdue them. However, at the time, it was certainly not clear that Henry VII would survive their plots. It was under Henry VIII that the last York claimants were decisively and conclusively dealt with. Henry VII never truly sat easy on the throne. And as you know, other minor rebellions linked to taxes, etc., uh, disrupted his rule as well. But after the death of Perkin Warbeck, there does seem to have been greater stability uh, to be able to actually successfully pass on the throne to his son, who was of an age where he could, you know, realistically rule, was something that had not been achieved since Henry IV had passed on the throne to Henry V. Ultimately, Henry brought about stability, but the Tudors were all plagued with the idea of legitimacy and how secure their grasp was on the throne. And that's something that you might even remember from Elizabeth I when she's got legitimacy problems due to Anne Boleyn and the situations around that, circumstances around that. Legitimacy is an ongoing sort of insecurity for the Tudors. So um, with Perkin Warbeck, just to refer to a particular question, um, so Amy asked, was Perkin Warbeck someone who really threatened Henry? Did he threaten him more than places like France and Scotland? And I think it's a great question, first of all, thanks, Amy. But I think it's worth considering how interconnected these two things are. So I'd argue that Perkin Warbeck was a threat because he not only had used the name of Richard, Duke of York, but he also... Uh, was an opportunity for Scotland and Burgundy to attack England. So I'll briefly explain again. I know some of this is really complicated because we're going and dipping back into this family tree quite a lot. Um, but I will point this out just so you know exactly who Perkin Warbeck is claiming to be and why this is so dangerous for Henry. So if you go on to the family tree, how we've got Edward IV. Uh, there he is. OK, so Edward IV here, he has a lot more children than that, but it's only put three on there for space saving. He has a son called Edward V and he has another son called Richard, Duke of York. They're the younger brothers of Elizabeth of York, Henry VII's wife. And these two boys, what happened to them, and you might remember from stuff early on about Richard III, is that Richard III takes the throne from Edward V. Then he summons Richard, Duke of York, Edward V's younger brother, his other nephew, to come to the Tower of London to be with his brother ahead of Edward V's coronation. At this point, these two boys mysteriously disappear and we never hear about them again. We don't know what happened to them. We don't know where they went. We don't know for sure if they were murdered in the Tower of London. We don't know if they escaped. We don't know any of these questions. And those two boys are the ones that sometimes called the princes in the tower. Now, Henry VII, it was really in his interest to sell the idea that Richard III had murdered these two innocent boys. And um, so that people would firstly think badly of Richard III and think, thank goodness, Henry VII's taken over. But secondly, he needs people to think that the Yorkist claimants are dead, particularly the sons of Edward IV. He needs people to know that they're dead. Now, in the Lambert Simnel Rebellion, when Lambert Simnel is pretending to be Edward Earl of Warwick, 
Henry VII has Edward, Earl of Warwick. So when that rebellion kicks off and Lambert Simdall's like, oh, I'm Edward, Earl of Warwick, Henry VII can say, no, you're not. Here is the real Edward, Earl of Warwick and can produce him to prove that Lambert Simnel is a pretender. With Perkin Warbeck, nobody knows where Richard, Duke of York is. He might well have been murdered. So Henry VII can't conclusively prove that Perkin Warbeck isn't Richard, Duke of York. Now, before you get too excited, a lot of historians would say that he probably wasn't Richard, Duke of York. But it is a little niggling fact that Henry VII has. He cannot conclusively prove Perkin Warbeck isn't the lost prince. And if he was really Richard, Duke of York, he would have an incredibly strong claim to the throne, even stronger than his wife's. So um, with Perkin Warbeck, the other threat that he obviously brings is his foreign connections. And this is the other thing that makes him dangerous. So Interestingly, Lambert Simnel also had foreign connections. And after the Simnel Rebellion, Perkin Warbeck had tried to go to Ireland to get help to support his claim and invasion of England. However, because the Lambert Simnel Rebellion had failed and the Irish had been quite heavily fined and punished for that, um, they don't want to support another rebellion. They don't want to risk it. So he doesn't get support from Ireland, which is quite good for Henry VII. But Margaret of Burgundy pops up and uh, rears her ugly head again. She's keen to support Warbeck, claiming that he was her nephew, the Duke of York. So Margaret of Burgundy is the sister of Edward IV. So you'll be able to find her on the family tree as well. I'm pretty sure she's on there. Have a little look. Margaret, Duchess of Burgundy. She is on there. She is the sister of Edward IV and of Richard III. Um, so she wants the Yorks to come back. She is going to support every Yorkist claimant that she can. So when Warbeck comes into the court of Burgundy and is like, oh, I'm the lost Richard Duke of York, Margaret of Burgundy is like, absolutely you are. The thing is, she'd never met her nephew. She was in Burgundy when they were born. She never met these two boys. She didn't have a clue really, but she sees an opportunity to dethrone Henry VII. And she likes that because she hates Henry because he got rid of her brother, Richard, who was the, the king at the time. So Warbeck goes and at the course of Burgundy in 1490, Warbeck first claims that he should be on the English throne. From here, Warbeck begins his attempts to take the throne. He's first received them by Charles VIII, the King of France, though Charles withdrew support later following the Treaty of Etat. Um, Warbeck was also shown the willingness um, was also received by many other foreign princes in Europe and his marriage to Lady Catherine Gordon, who was a relative of the Scottish King, also showed the willingness of James IV of Scotland to support Warbeck as well. I think it's highly unlikely that Warbeck was Richard Duke of York, uh, but he certainly caused Henry VII many headaches. And it wasn't until after his execution that Henry seemed to have seen off the Yorkist threat and it seems to sort of die down for the end of his reign. Um, so did Warbeck threaten Henry more than foreign places? Yes, in that he's exploiting the weaknesses of Henry's legitimacy, but no, in that he was dangerous because the foreign powers like Burgundy and Scotland um, chose to use him to try and ch challenge Henry VII of England. So he's he is his own player, but he's also used as political pawn by other people in Europe at the time, other princes. Closest allies in England was another question uh, that I have from some of you. So Henry trusted those who fought with him at Bosworth. So these people Henry could trust and get on with. And um, the main one is Jasper Tudor, his uncle. He was a man who Henry trusted implicitly. Also, old Lancastrians like the Earl of Oxford, who was from the De Vere family, uh, they were also trusted as they've been loyal to the Lancastrian cause for the whole of the Wars of the Roses. Um, of course, Margaret Beaufort, his mother, is another person he trusts, particularly at the beginning. She was heavily involved in helping him run his household early on, but increasingly he gets, uh, she gets put aside as Henry kind of grows into the role. Initially, Henry also trusted his mother's husband, Thomas Stanley, the Earl of Derby, but his trust started to wane with Thomas Stanley, especially following the execution of William Stanley, because William Stanley decides to support Perkin Warbeck. And a point on the Stanley brothers, it was very well known that during the Wars of the Roses, each brother would choose to fight on a different side, and then whichever side looked like it was winning, 
whoever was on the wrong side was swapped to be on the winning side. At the Battle of Bosworth Field, it's often said that actually it was the decision of William Stanley to send his army to support Henry that decided the outcome of that battle. But he later rebels, supports Perkin Warbeck, gets executed, means that Henry also starts to question Thomas Stanley a bit more. Henry instead prefers to rely on new men, the phrase that's used to uh, refer to men who aren't of the aristocracy, aren't the nobility. And he uses them to help him advise and run the country. And that's seen through figures like Sir Reginald Bray and John Heron, who would help oversee the crown finances. Henry could trust men who owed all of their success and wealth to him rather than some noble bloodlines and things like that, especially as his own claim was weak. Um, so in comparison to some of the nobility, Henry VII, some of the nobles could probably argue that they had a better claim than Henry did. So he wants to rely on people who owe everything to him rather than those nobles who have their own sort of source of authority. And Henry VIII continues that trend as well. So little shout out for him. Henry VIII continues this trend as he seems to have been incredibly aware that many noble families like the Howards have an equally strong royal bloodline. And they seem to want Henry VIII to act as a first among equals. But Henry VIII instead raises up men like Cardinal Wolsey, Thomas Cromwell. So this is a precedent that's kind of more set by Henry VII. He uses his new men who he can trust. Um, a couple of other things. So just the last question I think I have from you guys about security and then I'll talk about finances and then we'll see where the time's at as to whether we get onto anything else beyond that. Um, with the last question, it's about the respect and popularity for Henry VII. So bear with me one sec. So a lot of physical descriptions of Henry VII and not necessarily favourable, first of all. He's described by Polydor Virgil, who was a historian at the court of Henry VII, as having sallow skin and black teeth. But it is noticed he was slim, but powerfully, strongly built. It was clear that Henry VII definitely didn't look every inch the king in the way that Edward IV, Edward III, or even Henry VIII did. He doesn't have that sort of kingly bearing. He's not tall, he's not got like golden hair, he's not handsome, and he probably lacks the charisma that some of these other men had. His initial actions on becoming king were to also, you probably came across this, predate his rule to being the day before the Battle of Bosworth Field. Whilst this seems smart on the surface, because what that means is, is everyone who fought against him at Bosworth Field is technically a traitor, um, it was very unpopular and it was seen by many of the nobles as being very dishonourable. Um, this predating of his reign meant that yeah, most of them were guilty of treason. He also spent most of his life in Brittany and was not used to politics at the English court. So many viewed him as being very inexperienced, which he was. He had no reason to be good at any of this because this wasn't something that he had done before. Um, however, it's slightly different for the common people. So while the nobility have this view of this kind of really inexperienced, like, lanky, skinny, pretty ugly guy who's now their king instead of some beautiful Yorkist claimant. Whilst the nobility might think that of him, the commoners is slightly different. Um, firstly, we need to understand how kind of quickly or easy it was to communicate at this time. So it would take a day of riding for us to reach cities like Leicester and places like that. But if the king were to make that trip with the whole court, it's going to take a lot longer to get there. Therefore, the power and the influence of the king is limited geographically. Um, and if you remember from like Elizabeth's reign at GCSE, a lot of rebellions like the Northern Earls and things, they kind of just out of on the edges of the realms of her influence. So with Henry VII, there's this kind of feeling that for a lot of the commoners, it's not directly relevant to them, not directly relevant to their lives. Therefore, how far were common people bothered by the change of king? Well, Henry VII described, uh, was described by Stephen Gunn as being a master propagandist. Having historians like Polydor Virgil at court meant he was already rewriting history to reflect favourably on the Tudor dynasty and to condemn the villainous Richard III. As well as this, Henry VII's reign coincided with the recovery of the economy following the Black Death. So the Black Death absolutely destroyed the European population. As those populations are starting to recover, 
better customs duties are coming in. There's more demand for English cloth, things like that. So actually, the economy is now starting to improve as well, which meant that obviously people had less of a problem with Henry VII. So people benefited from the improving economic state. And as such, although Henry VII did not have the inspiring charisma and charm of Edward IV, he was probably not unpopular with the people. And I think a lot of people also relieved as well with the stability that he brought. As it said in some of the PowerPoints, we obviously don't, like at the time, they wouldn't have known that the Battle of Bosworth Field or the Battle of Stoke was going to be the end of the Wars of the Roses. A lot of people, you know, assumed it could have continued for years and years. But as things started to settle down, people were really pleased to see new levels of stability and security in England. So he probably wasn't like the most popular king. And certainly a few of them grumbled about taxation, as you saw in the Cornish rebellions. But it's not too bad. And I'll, fi I'll finish this little section um, with a question that Mason asked, which was, was securing a legacy the basis of Henry VII's decisions and policies as a king? I thought that was a really interesting question. I would argue that he is a very, very forward thinking monarch, that he is always trying to think a few steps ahead as to um, what kind of state he's going to leave England in. How can he build security, build his dynasty? And he makes very practical decisions like marrying Elizabeth of York and things like that, or marrying his daughter, Margaret, to the King of Scots um, or marrying Arthur to Catherine of Aragon. He is a very, very meticulous calculating and clever man and I think I read I can't remember which historian said it but some historians have argued he was probably the most able of all the Tudor monarchs so I think securing a legacy his legacy is going to be the dynasty he leaves behind and he is keen to build that and to help that last so in that respect I think securing a legacy probably was the basis of a lot of his decisions he's thinking long term he's playing a long game which brings us on to finances. So I will talk about finances and then I suspect that we will probably, if we're not already slightly Henry VII out, we might probably call it a day at that point. Um, but I will, what I'll do is I'll try and make some of my notes available on any other little bits. Um, I'll just have a quick look at any questions that people have had. Um, so do we get an example? exemplar coursework essay or just or look at any past essays to get an idea on how to write ours. Yes, I, I can provide you with some exemplars. However, um, I'm, I wouldn't worry about doing that yet. You don't need to know about exactly how to write these essays until we get into September. So for now, just we're looking at content, trying to get to grips with that. Um, with the exemplars, though, if you are really desperate, you can go on to the coursework Google Classroom page and under classwork there are a few exemplars. They are on the suffragettes um, because I need to check how far I'm allowed to show you um, previous Tudor courseworks. Um, they are suffragette ones that I taught a couple of years ago. Some of them are really good and it might give you a general feel for how to write it, how to structure it, how to balance the historians. I've got a few different ones on there. I've got 40 out of 40, a 38 out of 40 um, and all of that kind of thing on there as well. Um, oh, I just realised as well. Sorry, Karis, I know you asked um, in your questions about how much the coursework was worth. The coursework is going to be worth, let me remember, 20% of your A-level overall. So Russia's worth 30%, uh, Britain will be worth 30%, China's worth 20% and your coursework is also worth 20%. It works quite neatly mathematically because it basically works out that every 20 marks you do is worth 10 percent. So the Russia paper, there are three 20 mark questions you have to do and it's worth 30 percent. China, you have two 20 mark questions to do and it's worth 20 percent. With your coursework, it's out of 40. So if you work off that basis of every 20 marks being worth 10 percent, it's worth 20%. So it fits in quite neatly with all the others. But yeah, it'll be out of 40. Um, and for those of you who are wanting to kind of push to get um, A's and that kind of thing, I would recommend pushing to try and get, you definitely need to get over 30 to get an A, I think. Um, and if you're wanting to push for A stars, you really need to be aiming to get at least 36 out of 40 really on the coursework, which is doable. And there are a couple of examples on the coursework page of where students have done that. Okay, finances. Let's finish off with this one. So for Henry VII's finances, I know a few of you asked me to go over the chamber books 
um, which I understand, sorry, that some of that was quite confusing, but I think actually a more helpful approach for me right now would be to give you a general overview of Henry VII's financial policies. However, I might refer to some of the investigations as we go along and ideas discussed in the chamber books. Um, and afterwards, if you do have a specific term you'd like me to try and explain, feel free to add it in the comments. I'll have a look or you can send me an email um, as well and I'll answer that. So firstly, Henry VII's attitude to money. So I've kind of broken this section down. So I've got his attitude to money, use of new men, use of money to punish and control the nobility, and then just a short section at the end on other methods of raising revenue, just so you know some of the practical things he's doing. So firstly, his attitude towards money. Um, one question that historians love to pour over with Henry VII is his attitude to money. Was he rapacious and greedy or was he practical and preparing for the future or was he really fearful? Um, my general impression is that he was not necessarily greedy and many historians will possibly disagree with me here, but I believe Stephen Gunn will probably agree with me. He wasn't greedy, but I feel his main goal was to protect himself and the new Tudor dynasty from future threats. And I think one little reasoning I could use to try and support that is if John Guy is right in saying that Henry had, hadn't really improved the financial situation of the crown, then surely it wasn't greediness, but a need for survival that drove Henry to push quite so hard on all possible lines of income. However, it's worth pointing out, I don't really agree with John Guy about the state of the crown at the end of Henry VII's rule. He certainly has done a lot to repair it and improve it. I think the financial state of the crown significantly improved under Henry VII. I mean, his income was well over double by the end of his reign. I think in some cases, in some areas, he had multiplied his income tenfold. Um, and Guy's view is quite an unusual one if you are discussing uh, Henry VII money. If you wanted to do your coursework on was Henry VII greedy, you could do. And John Guy could be a historian you could use if you wanted. Um, yeah, I do still think it was a drive for survival that pushes Henry. That's that's my view. Um, did he stretch the bounds of what was reasonable for a king to demand? Quite possibly. Was he too hard on his subjects when pushing for more money? quite probably. Um, my take on Henry VII is, as with his approach to dealing with the nobility and rebellions, he was a calculating and efficient man, but he doesn't sit easy on the throne. But money equals power, so it's understandable that building up the crown coffers could possibly help this usurper king to feel more secure, more stable. That money can be used to reward loyal service. It could be used to bribe opponents, to fund armies, that kind of thing, if necessary. So I think Henry VII, in my mind, very much like he is a survivor. Surviving plots against him from the Yorkists when he was a boy living in Brittany, surviving and battling to actually become the King of England, and then surviving the rebellions thereafter. I think this mindset can probably help explain his attitude to money. It could also explain why he paid such close attention to this part of governance. However, worth pointing out, that is very much my opinion. Um, definitely historians could disagree. There'll be some who agree with me, some who don't. It's an area of contention, area of debate. Um, but I think just calling him greedy, I think is just lazy historiography, quite honestly. So that's my view on it. Second bit. Use of new men. So I referred to this in the security and legitimacy section. Um, new men really come into their own in the financial department. So Henry's chief advisors and servants were chosen from the ranks of lesser landowners, gentry, and from the professional classes as well. And this included men like Sir Reginald Bray. Uh, these men have been referred to as new men, uh, but it was not wholly new to use gentry rather than completely relying on the aristocracy. Um, I think Richard III had used some like lawyers and things to help him in the past. So it's not a totally new practice. Um, however, these new men came from families with generations of experience in local government, justice and land owning. As Henry was exploiting his lands through more efficient methods of estate management, he needed servants who understood auditing and property laws and had administrative skills. And some of the nobility just don't have those skills. They just can't do it because they leave it to these men from the gentry to do it for them. So 
real ability in these areas is what matters to Henry the most, not social class. So people like Reginald Bray became one of the most powerful of Henry VIII's counsellors. He was not from the aristocracy and had risen as a steward. So he's not like even really gentry. He's a steward in the house of Margaret Beaufort when she was married to Stafford. His service to the king was long and loyal. He's there from basically all of Henry, VIII, uh, Henry VII's reign, and he served as Henry's chief financial advisor. His close relationship with the king meant that he was basically the only person, apart from maybe Jasper Tudor, um, who had the freedom to rebuke and influence Henry. Bray is often credited with restructuring the revenue system and restoring financial health to the crown. Other new men included Henry's treasurer of the chamber, the highest financial officer of the crown. So you had Sir Thomas Lovell and also Sir John Heron as well. So the main thing here is just Henry is very clever in choosing to use people of ability to do things instead of just leaving it to a noble who doesn't know what he's doing. And it also plays into these men like Reginald Bray owe everything to Henry. So they're going to be loyal to him as well. Which brings us on to the next section, using money to control slash punish the nobility. Um, the nobility is an area that was a worry for Henry VII on gaining the crown. Uh, the Wars of the Roses had, after all, been able to spin out of control because of these kind of over mighty subjects. I mean, Richard, Duke of York, decides that he's going to make a push for the throne. And suddenly there's a battle of St Albans happening and the Wars of the Roses have kicked off. Henry VII needs to get the nobility in line and they need to learn their place. They're not above the king and they are not on the same level as the king. They need to learn that. So Henry sought to narrow the field. He, he seeks to kind of thin out the number of nobles that there are in England. Um, and in doing that, he basically is very stingy in giving out earldoms and dukedoms and things like that, which is one of the things a king can do, is he can make people appear, he can make them a noble. And he only makes three people nobles during his reign. And that didn't even include Reginald Bray. So he really chooses very few people. Um, as opposed to Edward IV, who made nine people earls. He also limited the amount of patronage he gave out. So patronage is basically um, like crown lands and finances and wealth and titles that is for the king to give out to his subjects. And with patronage, if you're the king, you've got to try and share it fairly so the nobles don't get too um, like infighting and stuff like that. And also you want to keep them on side. However, um, patronage with Henry VII, he really cuts back on the amount that he gives out. He didn't want to try and buy the loyalty of his nobility. He thinks that actually the patronage should be earned by them. So they've got to earn that patronage first. He's not going to try and pay them and then they'll be loyal. They're loyal first, then they'll get the patronage. Um, but he also used financial penalties to keep the nobles in line. So bonds and recognances, written agreements in which a person who offended the king in a particular way uh, was forced to either pay up front or promise to pay a certain sum of money or security for their future good behaviour. I'll briefly explain what a bond is and what a recognizance is, just so you know. So a bond is a written obligation in which people promise to perform some specific action on pain of paying money if they failed to carry out their promise. And a recognizance was a formal uh, acknowledgement of actual debts or other obligations that already existed. So a bond is basically you promise to do this. And if you don't do this, you owe me money. Whereas a recognizance is you've already done this and therefore you owe me money. You don't necessarily need to know the difference between those two. But just in case you do decide you want to talk about Henry VII's finances, that is the difference. Um, these bonds could range from like £400 in some cases for like commoners, people who are insignificant, to up to £10,000 for a peer of the realm. The greater the magnates or the greater the noblemen, the more likely what Henry was to bring them under this type of financial pressure. Henry also used the threat of these punishments and made examples of men who disobeyed him. So, for example, nobles were not allowed to maintain retainers. Those are basically servants, uh, that kind of thing, without the king's express permission. In 1506, 
Lord Bergaveni was fined five pounds per month per retainer, which amounted to seventy thousand pounds, seventy thousand five hundred and fifty pounds. Though Henry later suspended that debt in favour of a recognizance, the lesson had been learned, and it became clear to the nobles that Henry was going to favour destroying them financially over trying to have them executed or have them you know, removed politically. He was going to use finances to do that. And it would cripple them whilst making him even stronger and even more secure. So this is kind of his goal. So that brings on to other methods of raising revenue. The first one is crown lands. Henry inherited all the lands from the houses of York and Lancaster when he became king. And on the death of his uncle, uh, Jasper Tudor, and of his wife, Elizabeth of York, their lands reverted to him as well. Um, he further added to crown lands through escheats and attainders. So escheats are basically when a landholder dies without any heirs, basically like Jasper Tudor does. His lands would then by rights pass to the king. Attainders not only were used to declare people traitors and things like that, but they also took away their civil rights, most notably the right to own property. This land could then be merged into the crown lands after an act of attainder had been passed. Um, as Henry had very few relatives to share the lands with, he only has his son Henry after Arthur's died. He has very few favourites as well. That means that he grants away very few crown lands. One of the things of patronage that a king could give away was crown land. But because Henry VIII, uh, Henry VII doesn't really have that many people to give it to, he keeps most of it because he doesn't like have to give it away to favourites and things like that. In his first parliament, of 1486, he was even granted an act of resumption, which basically said that crown lands that have been granted away by previous kings since 1455 were to be returned to the crown. In practice, Henry didn't actually want to antagonise the nobles too much by taking away land that had been previously granted by Edward IV, Henry VI. Um, so he didn't regain control of all of those estates uh, that were granted in uh, granted to him by the Act of Resumption, but he does take back some crown estates that way as well. The most profitable and wealthy of the crown lands was the Duchy of Lancaster. Um, and actually, if you were to look into like the Queen and things now, she is still in charge of the Duchy of Lancaster. She still gets income from the Duchy of Lancaster, much as um, Prince Charles and Camilla get income from the Duchy of Cornwall. So these duchies kind of still exist. I'm not entirely sure exactly what their place is in modern the modern world, but they're still there. So the Duchy of Lancaster is the biggest source of income for Henry VII. Under Reginald Bray, the new methods were adopted and the income for that duchy improved from £650 a year in 1485 to nearly 7000 by 1509. So Henry VII not only acquires new lands, not only putting uh, bonds and recognances on nobles, but he's also generating more income from the land he already has. The next uh, method, so we've had bonds and recognances, we've had crown lands. The next method is custom duties. Um, although crown lands became a greater source of revenue than the custom duties were, the custom duties still made up about a third of the crown's ordinary revenues. So that's like everyday usual income. Twice during his reign, Henry VII updated the Book of Rates. The Book of Rates is basically an account book for recording the rates of tax paid by foreign merchants on goods imported and sold in England. So despite his efforts, though, the income from customs did not greatly increase during his reign. Henry was unable to completely stamp out things like smuggling, which meant that people were avoiding paying the custom duties. He couldn't quite get rid of smuggling and also things like international trade and international trade rates and demands are beyond his, even his powers of manipulation. So custom duties remain important. He's still trying to get the most out of it that he can. It doesn't really improve that much, um, but it's still used. Next one is feudal dues. So those are the traditional rights for a king um, for income from wardships and marriages. So this included wardships like Elizabeth Trussell, which was one of the ones that popped up in the chamber books. Um, every time a ward or minor noble got married or even major nobles, a feudal due 
was due to be paid to the king. So every time somebody at the court of Henry VIII wanted, uh, Henry VII wanted to get married, they would have to pay him some money as their feudal overlord to agree to the marriage if it's one that he didn't approve of in particular. Likewise, when a nobleman wanted to purchase a wardship, a feudal due was paid to the king. So wards are basically like they tend to be young children, uh, boys or girls could be wards, and they would generally have some kind of their own estate behind them. And noblemen quite liked buying wards, having them in their household, raising them with their children. And sometimes they would then buy, like um, get those wards married off to their own children or their cousins or into their family so that the income that the ward was due to inherit would go to their family, would add to their own family's wealth. So when noblemen want to buy wards, they have to pay some money to Henry VII to agree to it, basically. Um, and this is what happens with Elizabeth Trussell. She is sold as a ward to the Earl of Oxford. He buys her wardship. She has a lot of money and land that she's due to inherit when she grows up. And he raises her in his household and she eventually marries his cousin. And then like, it's good from there. And his family has now got more money through her wardship. Next one is profits of justice. So, so far we've had nobility, crown lands, custom duties, feudal dues. Next one, profits of justice. Um, Henry made it so that the punishment for most criminal acts, even treason, was to be fined rather than imprisoned or executed, which is something I mentioned earlier. An example of this is from the Cornish Rebellion in 1497, when Henry made more profit from fining the rebels. Um, the other main fine that was around at this time was attainders, which I've mentioned a few times now. Um, the highest number of attainders passed by Parliament was 51 in one Parliament sitting. I think there was only one Parliament session that was called that didn't pass an act of attainder. So William Stanley paid the Crown £9,000 in cash and £1,000 per year through attainder following his acts of treason in 1495. So this was a way for Henry to basically financially execute people rather than actually do it. And it made him very rich. Um, next one is Parliament. So Henry called Parliament seven times during his 24 year reign. The first five of those were during the first decade on the throne where he was the most unstable. Um, early on, Henry used Parliament to ratify his claim to the throne and to also deal out those acts of attainder, which basically ruled people as traitors. But the main function of Parliament um, had long been for granting taxes. Henry did not need to ask for taxes very often because his foreign policy was based on avoiding expensive campaigns abroad. He also did not want to strain the loyalty of his subjects with too many requests for grants of money. So sought for other ways to fill the treasury, hence the crown lands and all of the focus on feudal dues and that kind of thing. Um, finally, he did not feel the need to initiate legislation on a larger scale. However, Henry did ask for taxes from Parliament in 1487 to pay for the Battle of Stoke, in 1489 to go to war with the French to help the Britons, or the Bretons, sorry, and in 1496 to defend against attack from the Scots and Perkin Warbeck. And it's following those demands for extraordinary taxation that we can see the um, the rebellion starting from Cornwall and Yorkshire. Um, it's normally following those like uh, taxation grants from Parliament. The next one, uh, next way that he gets the money is a French pension, which was one of my favourite things about Henry the Seventh. As part of the Treaty of Etape in 1492, um, Henry negotiated a pension from the King of France. It was a bribe from the French king so that the English armies would be removed from French soil. Henry was promised £159,000 and annual payments of £5,000 from the French king. Now, the French king at this time is probably one of the most powerful um, or the most powerful, probably the most wealthy monarch or prince that there is in Europe at this time. So he could probably afford it. Henry VII making the most of it again, as usual. Um, and Henry's military spending was generally pretty low as he sought to avoid those costly campaigns abroad. He only really invests in military spending when it's to defend against rebellions at home. Um, and the next bit, last section that I'll do today and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Just a quick thing on Henry VIII, who hasn't really had much of a 
much of an airing in this talk, so don't worry, we will talk plenty about Henry VIII uh, another time, I'm sure. But under Henry VIII, Henry VIII was keen for wars in comparison to Henry VII, um, and he really wants to win glory. He was named partly after Henry V, the hero of Agincourt. Henry VIII really wants to live up to that, really wants to go and invade France. So he wastes a lot of money that his father had so carefully accumulated. The most expensive of his foreign expeditions were the ones to France. In 1544, Henry VIII invaded France and took Boulogne in his third invasion attempt, uh, which proved not only expensive in the conquering, but also then expensive to maintain and defend. Henry VIII also invested in the English Navy, which was probably quite a smart move. It certainly helps Elizabeth later with the Spanish Armada. Um, he invested in the English Navy, including his famous ship, the Mary Rose, um, although the Mary Rose sunk before it was even out of Portsmouth Harbour, which is probably quite symbolic of Henry VIII's finances and foreign affairs. Under Henry VIII, there were also the beginnings of a practice that's called debasement of the coinage, which was the devaluation of the English coin, um, and it led to inflation. But we'll probably talk about that a little bit more another time. So um, I think I will probably bring it to an end there because this has already been quite a long YouTube live session. Um, so thank you very much for tuning in. If any of you have any questions that you want to ask me or anything like that, do drop them in the comments. Um, otherwise, feel free to now leave this session. I hope you really enjoy VE Day um, and I hope we have a good time studying the Tudors. I promise it will be easier when we're all together again and we can like talk about this in person. Um, but if any of you want to ask questions, post them now. Otherwise, go and have a great day. I will hang around on here and see if anyone wants to ask me anything specifically. Cool. You are welcome. And look at that, by the way, before we go. This is the most accurate thing I've ever seen in my life. So just so you know. Cool. All right. Thank you, guys. It was lovely to have you log in. Sad I couldn't see your faces. But um, yeah, you saw mine. And I heard yours on the podcast, which were great, by the way. All right, um, what I'll do is I'll probably collate together my notes and I will email them around to you all so you can um, hear some of the things that I said today, uh, but also see a few of my notes that I made on like the, the later ones as well. Um, thank you, Mr. Towers. <laughs> but um, yes, and I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry, it was very long, um, but great. Cool. Um, I'm going to end this stream here because I don't think anyone's got any other questions. Um, so have a lovely bank holiday weekend. Mason, what are you trying to say? You just said the. I don't know. Cool. You're welcome. Saw it. <laughs> Saw it now. Great. Cool. Bye, guys. Thank you for coming. And.